Okay, so yesterday we stopped here, uh, thinking about how, why we need multiple evaluator, multiple expert in our uh, heuristic evaluation, not only one, and why three or, or four or four or five people evaluating uh, our, our design. And we, we know this uh, because, because uh, Nielsen did this, this experiment. Once he had the, the evaluation, uh, the procedure set, it uh, involved 19 hmm, evaluators uh, on a design that has 16 different usability problem and ask this evaluator to do to perform a heuristic evaluation for find any problem that they find. And all these 19 evaluators successfully complete the, the evaluation phase, the heuristic evaluation, and report it back the issues that they analyze according to the rules, uh, according to the procedure that we, we have seen yesterday. And then he put the evaluator in this graph here in which in, on the bottom here, there, are, there is the most successful uh, evaluator. So the evaluator that found much, the, the greatest number of issues in the, um, in, 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 the, in the designs. And here in the top, there is the, must, the most unsuccessful evaluator that is the evaluator that only find the, the, the little number, little number of issues. So the first one find, found uh, one, two, three, 10 different usability problem out, out of 16. And this one that is the, 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 the most unsuccessful evaluator, only three. And then he also put the, the usability problem in this order. Uh, here in, in this corner, there is the most easy usability problem and here the hard usability problem. And what we can see from this picture is that there is no evaluators that find all the usability problem. So we cannot rely on just one expert because nobody was able to, uh, to, to find every usability problem. Even if in this user interface, in this design, there were exactly 16 usability problems. So it was uh, done with, with a scope of exactly 16 problems in it. And and we also see that some evaluators like the first and the second one find different problems. So this problem wasn't uh, um, found by the, the first evaluator. These two were found by the first evaluator but not from the second. And we see there are also some hard problems. So this is applied for easy problem like these. These are a little bit harder. These are harder but were found by uh, the first four uh, evaluator, for instance, found all this problem. And this problem here, the hardest one, was just found by two people, one here and one here. So we cannot rely on, uh, on, on a single evaluator for, for this reason, because no evaluator was able in this experiment to find all the problem. And so it's better if we can put together different uh, evaluators and so that they can compensate each other and find different problem each other's to, to find the most, most of the problem. Uh, so, so this, this answer on why we, we need multiple evaluators and, and then how much evaluator do we need? Why three to five is the magic number that we reported yesterday? Well, Nielsen did another things. Nielsen created this um, formula here that basically uh, try to compute the probability of funding problems according to the number, funding usability problems according to the number of evaluator, one side that I here, and the number of existing but unknown usability problem, and also a ratio of visibility problem found by a single evaluator. So without going here into the detail, this is basically a static probability. Uh, Nielsen found this, it was able to depict this, this formula with some number, uh, with some of these variable uh, obviously filled uh, correctly, uh, found this curve. 
in which you can say that you can see that basically that reports here the number of evaluators and here the proportion of visibility problem found in a generic design and you can notice two things the first one is that this is not 100 uh, percent for two possible reasons the first one is that you you may need a lot more evaluator to reach uh, this is around 90 percent uh, to reach a higher score higher percentage and for the second the second reason is that you cannot really know how uh, exactly how much uh, usability problem you have in a design. So in the previous slide, there were exactly 16 because it was designed in that way. But in the generic user interface, you don't know if you have 10 usability problem, three usability problem, 100 usability problem. So it's really difficult to reach 100%. And it's also not even the scope of the risk evaluation to find every single problem. But, but just a quick way the, the remind from yesterday, uh, it was called a discount usability. So to find most of the problem to gather some evidence before continuing and doing other kind of evaluation like usability testing and so on. Uh, so the goal here for the risk evaluation is mainly getting the most of usability problem uh, so that the design team, the developer team can decide uh, which of them to fix, when to fix, how to fix them and so on. And so the first thing that we notice is this. The second thing that we notice is that we have a rapid slope here and uh, at around five evaluator, we have around 75% of problem uh, encountered. And then the slope is increased much, much less. Uh, and at 15, we reach around 90% of uh, problems uh, found. So we, we need to, 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 to take a uh, a triple number of evaluator from these five, so 15 instead of five, to just have an increase of 20 percent, uh, less than 20 percent, uh, while here we, we have a better increase. So this should already give you a hint why three to five is, is a good number, because according to this graph, five evaluators that independently evaluate things and then put together the results, we're able to find around three quarter of the usability problem. So it's really uh, most of them. Um, and why we came up to the three to five number? Because in addition to that, Nielsen also uh, computed the um, cost hmm, of, uh, um, of doing this work on recruiting people. Because you, if you need to recruit expert, you need to probably pay them, you need to, invest time, invest maybe some uh, um, equipment to, to do the evaluation. So you need people to, to commit people, to accommodate people in a place and so on. And, and this is a cost, especially for an industry, but it, it is a cost in general, like time, money or, or, or other uh, efforts and so on. So uh, projecting the, the benefit of identifying problem to the cost according to the number of evaluators, uh, Nielsen found that this curve at this, let's say optimum here around three to five evaluator. So the cost the benefit of finding problem in relation with the cost and the number of evaluator, find that the number of evaluator, three to five independent evaluator can provide a good compromise between the number of usability problem found and the uh, actual cost of having three of having evaluators coming in. So, in other term, we don't have a big benefit in, in, in from a full perspective of in, enrolling fifteen separate evaluators um, because they don't identify too much problem. In addition to the seventy-four five percent here, and so the and they are going to probably repeat most of the issues that they the other, their colleagues already identified before. So this three to five for this, again, discount usability as it was called in the beginning is the, a good number to, to consider for all these, uh, this consideration here. In the process, so back up to the process for a while. So we had this three to five later, we have the, the process, they have to follow this uh, heuristic, the, the procedure for heuristic evaluation. And 
uh, they can come up with a list Uh, it was a ring a question. Was this analysis done only on the data gathered by the first experience? No, overall, for, for the first experience, you mean um, the first time that they ran the, the heuristic evaluation? Ah, on the first study? On this? No, it should be done in another moment, actually, uh, because here they don't know the number of existing problem. So it should be more, more generic. Uh, so we we come up with this procedure and we come up with uh, these um, with these three to five evaluator and they follow the rules and find let's say 10 uh, 100 I don't know how many problems they can find and then at a certain point they need to rate these to say okay this problem is most important than another most important because it has a great impact or because it's more deep, more it's a hard problem or, or for, for some reason. So what, what the procedure is asking reviewers, uh, experts to do is to rate their finding the list of violation according to a severity rating. And this severity is actually a combination of different things. It's a combination of the frequency of the problem of which the problem occurs. So this is a very common problem that happens in every single page or it's in the navigation of the web, uh, the web page, for instance, so that they actually happen everywhere or it's something really, really rare that happens just one time uh, per year or uh, uh, under certain conditions. So if you click this and this and this, then you have this problem. And then which is the impact of the problem when it occurs? It's easy to overcome the problem or it's difficult? Is the, the web application that is stuck and frozen and you cannot do anything else than close your browser or it's just a warning that you can ignore and proceed you as, as a user ignore and proceed with your task, with your goal, with the, your usage of the application. So the frequency, the impact and the persistence. It's a one-time error or it will occur many times to the user. Again, it's something that happens before because they follow a specific uh, procedure that is maybe something rare or something that don't really happen. It's not really requested by the majority of user because it's in, in a specific page in a specific part of the application or is something that again, it's in the navigation and so happens every time you click on the navigation, for instance. Okay. So the expert should not only, uh, should, should take the, his, his her defined violation and rate them according to the severity of this violation, taking into account these three elements, the frequency, the impact and the persistence and combine a severity rating individually for each evaluator. Mm -hmm as I said yesterday. And this severity rating scale, scale uses this, four, this five level um, scale that again, needs to, to take into account the frequency, the persistence and the impact as, as before. So it could be a, four, a level four uh, severity rating that is a catastrophe. So this must be fixed. It doesn't matter, but it's so terrible that needs to be fixed or it could be zero. So yeah, it's maybe it's a problem. It's not a usability problem. It could be nice to, to have this fixed, but probably it's not a problem at all. It just happened uh, and something like that. And in the middle, uh, you have other two level. Level number one is cosmetic problem. Okay, you can fix it if you have time. Uh, minor usability problem. Yeah, it's, it's really minor because maybe it happens a low frequency, maybe it happens with uh, low persistence, persistence and maybe as a medium impact, uh, for instance, and a major usability problem instead is important to fix. So it should be given high priority. It's not a, a terrible thing, but it's better to fix it because maybe have high, frequ if, um, high frequency and high impact. So it's better to, to fix it uh, anyway. So uh, every expert rate uh, her viola violation in this, in this way. And then in the, in the discussion phase, 
uh, or before giving the validation and the list to the to the designer to the developer you need to uh, put together this rating because you may have one evaluator that signed uh, the first issue the of, uh, issue number uh, uh, issue a let's say uh, um, with a level four and another evaluator that think that the same issue as level one so how do you decide if it's a catastrophe or it's something cosmetic or, or something like that so you, you need to have a, a way to to derive one decision to proceed you as developer or as designer so after all evaluator completed the ranking so they have the list they have the ranking you have two options typically the first one is the is that you have them discuss and agree on a consensus. So one say, okay, this is a level one and the other say, this is a level four and they discuss on the, the motivation behind their choice and they agree that in the end, this is level number three, for instance, so level number two. And the other option is just avoid them discussing or if they are not able to agree on a consensus, just compute the average of the ratings. So you have uh, for one issue, uh, rating four, four and one. And so in the end, you will have three as overall rating and you can work on with these three, considering these three as a major is a bit of a problem uh, and, and work in this direction. And then finally, so level zero, is for those things that are actually not really problem, not really usability problem. Maybe it's it's some other kind of usability. So uh, sorry, I, I for for the people let's say that see this after. Uh, I have a question to say. I did not understand level zero. If an evaluator ranks a problem, it will surely have a level higher than zero. Otherwise, it's not even considered. Yes, and level zero as for those problem that are not maybe usability problem. Maybe they are problem. Maybe there is an issue. Maybe it's just a technical issue, or maybe it's uh, I don't know. It's a typo in the text, or, or something like that. No, something that is terribly easy to to, to fix uh, if you want, or that can be ignored, or just I don't see the color, or I don't like the color, or something like that. So something that could be a problem, but maybe not. And so it could be uh, highlighted with zero. Um, so in the end, after all these, there is the debriefing phase in which all the evaluators meet with the server, if you add one, and the members of the developer team, and they discuss, go through the uh, final analysis, put together the severity rate, ranking and the violation and discuss line by line how can we fix it? How much will cost to fix it? Uh, if it's something maybe that is again in one page that is very, very rich and very, very, for, for very, very expert people in your application. So it's rich maybe three times per year or something like that. Also all this time kind of consideration came in the, the briefing phase and the, the briefing phase can also be useful for brainstorming other uh, ideas that stem from these uh, analysis. So to, to summarize the, the, the process and the pro and, and cons, uh, we have for heuristic evaluation here, heuristic evaluation is faster, is one to hour per evaluator. And if you have evaluator working in parallel is basically one to hour. Uh, results are pre-digested, pre-interpreted because it's the evaluator that is the expert and tell you where is the problem, what is the problem, and possibly how to fix the problem. Uh, it could generate false positive in the analysis, maybe something that could be a usability issue, but it's not really a usability issue uh, when the, the actual user uh, are using the, the application because maybe it's a misinterpretation of the expert that doesn't know well the domain or, or something like that, or is not yet a complete feature and then you are seeing a problem where there is no problem because it's just incomplete. So it could be, it will be solved once the, once the, uh, the feature will be completed. And you may also miss some problem as we have seen in the picture of the 19 evaluator. So, and also in the others in which 
uh, three to five evaluator will be able to catch around 60, 70 percent, 75 percent of all the usability problems. And, and this is the heuristic evaluation. And on the other side, we have the user testing, the usability study, and the control experiment, all this, this part that has other features that we will uh, see later on this course, but they are more accurate because you have your target population, you have your actual user, you have your task, uh, the main task for, for a system, for application, but you need to develop software, prepare the setup, uh, set up the laboratory or set up the study in the wild and so on. And uh, as I said before, as I said before, these are, this could be reinterpreted in a complementary way in which you can alternate the methods to find different problem in different stage of the design. You can apply one in the prototype, the other in the end, uh, and also uh, alternating these methods or uh, using them together in different phases could also allow you not to waste participants because for, because for the heuristic evaluation, you need just three to five experts and every time you need three to five different experts. While for the user texting, testing, you maybe need 10, 12, 20 different people in your target population and every time you need the same number or around the same number of people doing the testing of your application. So, it's also a way not to waste participants and not to recruit too many people to do the evaluation. So a good way as in many of the methods and the, and the techniques that we have shown uh, you up to, to this moment, everyone has some pros and some cons and most of them can be put together or used in different uh, phases to give different ideas, different to highlight different issues to be solved uh, in, in that moment. So finally, so now we have more or less go through the process. You will go through these uh, in an exercise next week, but uh, in this process, you need these heuristics, these rules mm. to give these rules to your expert so that the expert can see this rule and try to apply this rule to the actual uh, design to the actual user interface that he is evaluating. Um, so before following the process and during the process. So just to recap briefly the process, you recruit three to five because you, you are going to do an exercise next week and then you, you will need in the lab. You're going to recruit a certain number of experts, let's say in theory, uh, three to five people that are experts. Um, each of them receive a list of heuristics, these, if we want to, to speak about the Nielsen heuristics, that are 10 principle. Notice that we call it principle because actually they are principle. And we, we will see that they are not really different from the principle that you already uh, have seen in the past weeks. So you give them 10 principles uh, on a piece of paper or digital or, or, or physical paper a pen, let's say, and the user interface in some way. And individually, these evaluators in different rooms, in different moment, they don't have to, to listen to each other, obviously, they will evaluate your prototype, your system, according to this rule and writing all the stuff where the rule is, why it's important, why there is the violation and how probably to solve the violation and give a severity rating from zero to five, to to four. Uh, typically, what happens in this procedure is that in addition to the 10 principle, you also add uh, 11th principle, principle that say uh, other, basically. So other problem that are not a violation of these, but that could be useful to, to list uh, other things that you notice that are not a violation of this 10 principle, if any. Uh, so you have this list, you have the evaluators and the evaluators doing this work individually and then they put together uh, the evaluations, uh, uh, agree or compute the, the average of, of, the, of the severity rating and give you as developer, as designer, as the creator of that system or application or user interface, uh, the, the list of violations with possible uh, problems and uh, maybe also some solution to how to solve this. Okay. So this is to recap. Uh, 
which are the STEM principle, according to Nielsen. Uh, for next week, uh, when you're going to do the exercise, maybe uh, try to have these uh, 10 uh, heuristics somewhere on a piece of paper or in another monitor on your screen so that you can follow the exercise uh, having these in front of you or, or close to you um, for the exercise next week. Uh, so which are these 10 heuristics? So, so these 10 heuristics we will go through in, in this hour uh, with them with some example and suggestion, but basically the 10 heuristics are reported obviously on the Nielsen Norman Group website with a title and a brief description here for each of them. And they also have very short, two minutes long, um, three minutes long, like 20 minutes here for all the 10 usability heuristics. So videos, very short videos on YouTube about the 10 usability heuristics that it could be uh, wise to, to have a look at it before uh, the exercise of next week so that you can have a, a recap, let's say Monday, maybe have a look at these 10 videos, just to have a recap of what we are saying in this, in this hour. But basically in this hour, I'm going to expand a little bit and exemplify a little bit what is, is reported in these videos and in this, in this, page, in this page and in the, the linked page. So, 10 heuristics. These are the title of 10 heuristics and you should immediately notice that some of them will remind you uh, principle and theories that we uh, have seen up to now. So the first one is about the visibility of the system status. The second is a match between the system and the real world. What we called up to now uh, matching the mental model of the user essentially is this, ensuring that there is no violation between what the system is doing and the mental model uh, of the user, and there's a good match. Uh, the third heuristic is about user control and freedom. The fourth about consistency. Again, another uh, topic that you already have listened as a lot of time and standards to, to do things in a standard way, not to create again, to, to increase consistency. The fifth is about error prevention, then recognition, instead of reminding or remembering things, how to work, have the, the system that allow me to recognize features of things that action that can I do. The seventh is flexibility and efficient use, aesthetic and minimalist design after, and the ninth and the 10 is, is about helping, uh, with the ninth that is help user recognize, diagnose and recover from errors. So it's about uh, error recognition, diagnosis, recovering solutions and so on. And the tenth is about the help of completing operation, not only errors and documentation. So these are the title of the 10 heuristics. Now, now let's go through them in this hour. So uh, around uh, a few minutes for, for each. So the first one is visibility of system status and a, a little bit long description is uh, the system should always keep the user informed on what is going on through appropriate feedback and within reasonable, reasonable time. What does mean? That when something is happening, you are submitting a form, you are doing a request, you are typing something, the system should keep user informed on what is the status, what is happening, if it's correct, is it not correct, is it processing or not. And here you see four different examples. So here you see that the file is probably starting to upload and you have this animation here. And similarly here, this other tool is uh, presenting the upload phase probably or the completion phase of some process. So you started as a user process and system the website in this case is telling you, okay, I am here around 20% in the process and this bar will hopefully move up to the end. And also have a annotation here that say what is happening in this case is fluffing clouds. So it's not really useful for, for the user, but 
but it gives an idea that things are moving, that the system is not stuck, that uh, what the user uh, started to do is proceeding in the process. Uh, these are other two examples. Here you have uh, a password indicator. You already have seen this multiple times, probably in your life. While you type a password, an indicator here tells you if the password that you are typing according to some rule is strong, medium, weak, on, on etc. And this happens while you type. This not happens after or in the next page. While you type here, the password, this password strength indicator change. So you have immediately a feedback that your operation is not only working because you see also here typing, but the, the password that you type here that the system asks you to have is actually strong or weak. And then you can decide what to do with this information, but you have a feedback on what you are doing. And here there is another example. Probably um, these women, Teresa, Neil, asked for, forgot the password and asked for a password uh, to, to change the password, to recover the password. And the system say, okay, your request, your request of a new password has been taken into consideration and you now should be, should open your email client and look for an email because you will receive an email, hopefully not with your password, hopefully, the system don't send a password, a visible password in an email, but uh, it sends an email with some information about recovering the password, about changing the password with a temporary password or something like that. But it, without thinking of the content of that email, the point is that in this case, also in this case, the system is presenting a um, confirmation that the action that the user uh, dad did, uh, in this case, requesting a password change, worked and worked successfully with clear instruction of what to do next. In this case, open the, 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 the email. And which kind of feedback you can have on this, on this, uh, on this part, well, you can have different kinds of, of feedback. You have a feedback about time, like execution time for task. Uh, for instance, here, you have feedback about time in this two. Uh, you can have feedback about space, like occupation. You are using the 25% or your Google Drive space. A feedback about change, ensuring that the user is aware of the changes that he requested. So the status of the change, uh, I, I'm asking to delete something. Okay, you have deleted it. You have a feedback that the things was deleted or you have a, a confirmation that you really want to delete. And after the confirmation, you, you see in some way that that item has been deleted. And similar for save and similar for send, like in the case of the password in the, in the previous slides. You can also have a feedback about the action, what's happening. Is something running? Is something is something stopped? Uh, and about the next step, what will happen because of your action? I'm clicking next. What happens when I click next? And possibly also the next action, this point. Uh, uh, and for instance, I am in a form, in a multi-page form, and I am in page one. And in most of the form, I can see that after page one there will be another page because of the next button, but I can also see that the form is maybe made of four different pages because it's clear identified that I am at page one and then there is a page two, page three and page four. And if I press next, I move to the next page. And also a feedback about completion. Clarify when an action has been finalized. Okay, you have done. Now you can close the browser. Yeah, now you can go back to the home page. Now you can do other things. So feedback about essentially time, space, change of things in the user interface, action, next steps, and completion of activities. For the time and a little bit for also the, the action, uh, when, when it's a time-dependent action, 
uh, as a rule of thumb to give feedback, uh, if the execution time is really, really short, so it's less than one second, just show the outcome of the action. So if you're uploading process, let's say in a, like this, like this one here, if this is something that happens, this bar full, go full in less than one second, just skip the bar and just show the outcome, uploaded, done, whatever. If it's, so don't waste time or don't try to show a bar progressing and then the bar completed because in one second, you will not see, the user will not see anything. We'll just see the bar completed or some strange animation in some cases. This is a rule of thumb. If it's around one, two seconds, then show feedback that the action is underway because there is time to see that things are unfolding. If you have a longer time, like two, three, 10 seconds, uh, something like that, show the progress, show the percentage. So the estimate time to completion. Okay, I need uh, to copy this file. I still need one minute. I still need three seconds to complete the operation. Just to give, always give feedback to the user, uh, explicit the state of the system and tell the user that the system is not frozen and that the operation is, is it was accepted without any problem. And so, so it can or, or wait or proceed with other activities. The second is matching the mental model, essentially. The system should speak the user language with word, phrases, and concepts that are familiar to the user and not familiar to the developer or familiar to the system. Following familiar meta metaphor, following familiar um, languages, convention, in the order, logical order that the user is expected to find in the system. So for instance, here, everybody has the concept of what is a library or what is a store. And, and that this is a list inside, let's say, the library. And everybody has an idea with his music, movies, TV shows, and so on. And also here for printing, you have a lot of option, and, but you have to, to speak the user uh, language. And when you maybe have, have some difficulties in speaking the user language here, putting this picture help to contextualize and to say, okay, I select uh, mm, a, an option here and I see here what happens. So I have a match between what the system is going to do in this case, printing a page and what the, the printer will do and what will be my results. That is having a page printed exactly as I've shown here with this margin, with these colors and, and so on. So matching the real world, not only in the system is interface, but also action that bring from the virtual world to the physical world in a clear way and with clear procedure. Obviously, to do this, you can exploit familiarity. You should exploit metaphor that are familiar, like paper, folders, highlighters, like you know, in Word you can. So this is, for instance, a pen. This is a metaphor of a pen. Obviously, it's not a real pen. It's, I, I'm using my mouse to do this, but this is a metaphor, and this and it's a familiar metaphor because probably everybody know what is a pen and that a pen draw something uh, on, on some space in, in generally on paper, but uh, also here. So this is a, a metaphor, this is a familiar metaphor to identify something for write or draw. And similarly, familiar languages. So avoid acronyms, avoid jargon, avoid things word that could be unknown to the user, to your target user, because maybe are too domain specific or are but it's the technical term, but it's not comprehensible if you are doing an application for the general population, for instance. Uh, obviously, in some domains, if you are doing the flight control uh, system that we mentioned yesterday, you, you will need to use acronyms and to use jargon because there's specific of that domain, but the user are the user that are familiar with that domain. So for them, those acronym and those jargon is normal, is clear because it's is how things, how they call things in the real world. So 
avoid jargon and acronyms, acronyms when they are unknown to, the, to the, your user. If you cannot avoid them, you can use it, the acronym or, or the jargon, but try to use less possible and to specify very well what this acronym means or what this jargon means. Similarly, familiar categories and familiar choices. So explain the meaning, for instance, of the error message. Not just say, okay, this is a 503 internal server error, but say, okay, we have a problem with our website right now. So you cannot use, explain what happened. We have a problem in our website. Uh, what are the consequences? In the case of 503, for instance, could be, uh, you cannot complete the operation. And what are the available options? Click here to go back to the home page. So just an example. But when you have a message, an error message, don't write the message that you will understand, like uh, 404 page not found, that is maybe a little bit more understandable, or 503 uh, internal server error, because it doesn't mean nothing for most of the person, internal server error. What, what can I do with this information that is there is an internal server error? Actually, what can I do? Not a developer, as a user website. So tell me what can do, which are the, op the, the option, which are the consequence with respect to the action that I, I, I was doing. I, I need to redo the action, I lose my data, what happens? So tell the user how to behave in front of your, or your system. Uh, third, user control and freedom. So user often choose system function by mistake because life happens and I click somewhere where I don't want. And they will need to, to exit from some situation easily uh, and without following a, a long path and a straight way, but with some flexibility. And also connected to these support undo of the operation and redo of the operation when possible. And these are two example. So here, if I start, I click here on search, appear this, but I can cancel the search here. I can cancel the search here. Probably if I click here, I will close this tab. And so it's not constrained in an operation. There is flexibility, there is freedom. I can also start writing something here, but then press cancel or press here and move to another uh, option without mm, tons of dialogue systems, say, are you sure, are you not sure, and so on. And similarly here, this is for creating survey templates, I think. So you have a series of option here in the first column, a series of step here or other option here actually, and your survey here. So you from here, you can go back here, you can select the number six, you can go back in the registration phase without being constrained to the fact that you are creating uh, or completing a survey in this portion of the page, but you can move freely in the website. In, uh, you have control, obviously, uh, of what is happening. It's not the system that control you, it's you that have, exact, have control on what happens on the website. As a suggestion, always provide a back or equivalent button and also a user to explore different paths except for those wizards that should uh, hey, that they are aimed to help the novice users or the first time users to go through your application. So wizard like the one that you may encounter in many mobile application right now when you install the first time mobile application, you say, okay, welcome. Now scroll on the right and you see what happened next. And this is another function, scroll on the right and will go through the, the wizard presenting the application, the functionality. So obviously for this, you have a straight path that you cannot skip if you never seen the application before, but when the user is in your application and it's not a first time user for the first function, it's, it's a good idea to have them explore different paths to do the, the same or similar uh, actions. Uh, Always on these user control and freedom, these are other 
for example, you see here, if I click here and uh, I'm editing this formula that is basically B2, this, this cell multiplied by this cell, I'm here, I can edit here in the text. I have a clear indication that this is B2 because it's blue and this is C2 because it's uh, orange. And then I can press uh, this symbol here to accept the formula or here for canceling, or I can also click here and go out of this. There is a lot of freedom in doing this. The fourth is about consistency and standard. Users should not have to wonder whether different word, situation, or action means the same things. And when possible, follow platform or other application convention. So I think that here, well, uh, obviously you, you should be consistent. Uh, so if you are calling one thing, uh, let's say uh, uh, a specific feature, I don't have an example now, but if you call a specific feature A in the first page, you are not going to change that name in the next page, but just to follow with the name. You decide that this operation is called uh, book a train ticket and this is book a train ticket for the entire application and you decide that you put uh, the creation of a new what, a meeting and uh, under a specific menu or under a specific button and that menu and that button should be consistent in all the pages where you can create something as a meeting and if you need to create, maybe you have a plus button for create a meeting, and then you can use the same plus button also for create other things for consistency in your application. And a great example of this consistency is uh, Microsoft Office, the suite. This is quite old, but today, more or less, they are following the same uh, idea. Uh, if you have a user here uh, that is using Microsoft Word and is used to use Microsoft Word, uh, he know that in, on the top of the screen, uh, he will find a series of menus. And when they click, open a bigger uh, portion with different option. And if he needs to insert a picture in Microsoft Word, he, uh, the user has to click on insert. And then here, it finds a picture for adding the picture. So this is something that happens in Microsoft Word. If you are in, I suppose, Excel, you have the same identical structure, consistency, not only within the application, but with the suite of application that are in the same, same area by same, the same manufacturer, by the same producer in this case. So a user in Word, another picture is under insert and the same user, if it's open for the first time ever Excel for any reason, uh, he will find the same, more or less, the same menu, not identical because obviously in Word you have references, hey, here you have formulas, so it's not identical, but the structure is the same. And for some common part like insert or page layout, in insert you find first element, the shapes exactly as in Word. And in the insert menu, there is the picture insertion exactly as in Word. So the knowledge in a certain sense is, uh, you can move the knowledge from one application to the other because they, this, they are integrating a part of a suite. And this is consistency, this is standard. Standard also means that for saving, maybe you have to use this because it's recognized as a symbol for saving. And for red, undo things, you have to use this because also this is a recognized as a symbol nowadays of saving and so on. So suggestion for this, uh, look for, and when you design application, think about the consistent layout for dialogues and form. So the position of the element, uh, position of the confirmation button, uh, categories, list of names should be taken from standard vocabularies if possible. Not everybody inventing this, that a different set of uh, geographical region in different order with different uh, way of calling things. And also consistent meeting for okay, cancel, yes, no dialogue. For instance, it's better to avoid, do you want to interrupt task? Uh, what does mean? 
interrupt task, which task, the one that was doing, the one that is doing the system. So much more, more clarity and which is the answer to this? Yes, no. If it is the answer is okay and cancel. Do you want to interrupt task, cancel? Uh, so level button with the actual effect also of the, of the option. So it, it's, it's pretty, um, as an example, for instance, you may have seen somewhere um, the, the dialogue that say, do you want to cancel the operation? And that this dialogue at your button, okay and cancel. So actually you should press okay to cancel the operation. But since do you want to cancel the operation and you have a button that say cancel, it could be also reasonable to click cancel because yes, I want to cancel the operation. That is the same verb, the same word that is written in the text. So it could be confusing or uh, distracting, or if you don't read very well, you press okay without thinking. And then uh, you realize that you don't want to cancel, for instance. So you press cancel because you, you read quickly and you didn't notice that there is an okay in the other side. And, and so also this is for more about mistakes, but also preventing mistakes in this way because people could be in a hurry, people could not read everything and so on. So this is an example of this, of this part. Uh, so this is the same version one, version two, and version three. So version one is the bad one. Obviously it's understandable. Do you want to run the software, software, okay, and cancel? It's understandable, but it's not really natural. So if, you, if I ask you, do you want to run the software? You don't answer cancel by saying no. You say probably, do you want to run? Yes or no. You are not answering cancel if you don't want to run a software. So this is really bad, even if this is standard button, okay, and cancel. This is better because it's a natural answer of this question. Do you want to run the software? Yes. Or do you want to run the software? No. This is even better because it's recalled the name and also it's able to, let's say, help in preventing error by mis misreading this uh, or quickly reading this. So do you want to run the software? Yes, run or no, don't run. So it, it reinforces that the, op, the option to select is about running the software. So this is acceptable and it's something that you, you will see a lot. This is to avoid if possible because it's not natural and it, one can click on okay without thinking. And this is better because it's, it's better specify uh, which is the action that you are allowing or not allowing the system to do. Five, error prevention. That is partially connected to, to what I've seen, uh, I've said before in the slide before. Even better than good error message, even better than, yes, good error message is careful Uh, so I have a question. In this case, I think this case, having different name for each interaction can limit the consistency. For example, having always yes, having always yes or no can be more useful for the user. Well, uh, as always, these things are a matter of balancing things. Uh, so if you have a lot of dialogue, but really a lot of dialogue, uh, you could be a little bit more consistent if you always use yes or no. But Maybe there are cases in which you, you, it doesn't make no sense to use yes or no, or maybe the question is really um, important and the user need to reflect before pressing the button. So changing the consistency could also help in this case to highlight that there, there is something different to pick more attention about things. So it's not that obviously consistency should be good, but it's, yeah, mm, I don't know if you probably have seen this in visual design, but sometimes breaking the consistency or breaking something as expected, uh, for, uh, allow people to focus more on what it's, it's happening right now. And so uh, it can decide better and not by instinct. Mm -hmm. So yes, I always pre press yes. And so I press yes also this time. Mm -hmm. um, so error prevention, better than good error prevention is a design that prevents problem from occurring, obviously, in, as in many, uh, not only in visual design, but in, in many places. Instead of describing error, if we can 
avoid to have the error is better. So it's better to eliminate error prone condition or check for them before moving on and then present user with a confirmation option before they commit to the action. If this action is maybe destructive or if the action is uh, creating something new. So it's, it's important as an action. So uh, you can prevent that loss. You can prevent clutter, the user interface. You should prevent confusing flow. I'm going from page one to page two and then in page two, I go to another page and then I need to open another website and then I go back. So confusing flow, uh, prevent bad input. So I'm typing something and press okay. And then the problem say, no, this is a mistake. Yeah, so I can prevent that bad input would be in some cases. If I want a number in a field, I can prevent people writing other things that are not number. But also on the other side, prevent unnecessary constraints. So provide the fault for some operation when I can provide the default because maybe my website is in English and my, my, my default for a search form is in English, for instance, or my operating system is in English. And so the website will recognize it and show me uh, uh, the, the local language in English. It's the fault that uh, it applies. Hmm. And, and these are two examples, obviously, but this should be uh, more trivial for you. Um, so this is an example. Do you see that this update button is disabled? You cannot press this button until you write something here or attach a file. Uh, so you you, you prevent an error because if I press update, if I can press update before writing this, probably I will generate an error to say you cannot share nothing in the website, but you should write something or attach file. So I'm preventing the error by disabling the button. Then I can write something here and this button will be enabled and can compress the button and the sharing will probably work. Also here could be a sort of prevention, uh, not in the sense of this, uh, and then we have other example after this slide, but in the sense that you see the, the primary action is bigger, is a button, is green. And while the secondary action is just a link, smaller, uh, a little bit on the right. Uh, why? Because this is also visual indication that these two actions are different action. And one is the primary, the submit. If you fill, probably this is a form. If you fill the form correctly, you want to submit a go over and you have to press the big green button here. Instead, if you want to cancel, you don't have to press the big button, but you have to press the cancel button. So this is also helping distinguish the two different condition. One is to going back, cancel, and the other one is to confirm the action and proceed. So also this is a, a, a way, if you have two buttons here, both green and both with same font here, just with the text different, it could be a more confusion. It could be, if I am not totally uh, focused on what I'm doing, I can press the second button by mistake or I can put the, the, first, the second button before for, for any reason. And so I can press the first button that is canceled. So I can, uh, the system can, it does not support me in preventing the error. Uh, in short, you have to, to remember, I, I'm doing all the example by saying that the people make mistakes, but you have always to remember that all people, so also we are probably, surely are also, are a mess, so are confusing, have a lot of things that unfold in their life. And so when maybe they are filling up out a form, they are not in silence with one hour to, to focus 100% on, on, on the work, but maybe they are filling out the form and the phone is ranking, is ringing and the notification is arriving and there is another person in another room that he is, is calling. So life is, is happening, in, uh, around the application, around the system, around the action that the user is doing. So errors, slips are, are possible and will happen because again, people are a mess in this kind of things in, in general, because a lot of things together may happen. So help, try to help people not to make errors, considering also these things that in, in life could, could unfold uh, 
independently from, from the, the user interface. And these here, we have other two examples. So here, for instance, is uh, auto-completion. It helps it help the user while he's writing letter by letter to uh, have a series of options that he can select. So I am start typing design and this help selecting one of the options. Then I can continue to type and these options change will change. But this also helps to recognize if I, if I say it, instead of design, I invert the N with the G and vice versa, uh, the auto completion probably stop or maybe it's a little bit more smart and recognize that there is just a swap of letters and provide the right results. So it's easier if I need to, if this is a very important field, it's easier to select these design clothes instead of writing here the exact correspondence uh, of what I need to, to do in this moment. So also this is error prevention. It's also, use, it's also a shortcut for the user, but it's also helping preventing errors. Sixth, recognition rather than recall. Also this should be a, a topic that you have uh, already a lot of seen, uh, seen a lot in the past when speaking about principle. Minimize the user memory load by making things on screen or whatever visible. So I don't have to remember information. Okay, yes, yeah, so what I wrote you know, on page number one, and then now I need what I wrote there, I don't remember. Or instruction or, or things from one page to the other, from one portion of, of the website or the application from the other. And instruction for user system should be visible and easily retrievable whenever appropriate. So here we have two example that you are probably all familiar with. In this case, I start typing, uh, okay, I would like to, to do a string compare, let's say in, I don't remember the exactly the, the, the method and we also the parameters. So in this case, Heidi, uh, you start, but obviously it's something about string and compare. So I can start writing ST because it's string and, and the system support me by presenting all the things, all the methods that I could uh, start with ST or as ST in, in the text probably also. And I, I can see string compare. So, okay, yes, this is what I want. And so I can click on this and the system will put here string compare. MV is also more helpful. And this is also error prevention in a sense, uh, obviously, because maybe also show me which are the uh, variables to be put uh, in, in this, to be used in this method. So the first one could be, I don't remember if the first one is a string or is um, an integer or is other things, but a system could tell me, okay, now after you're selecting string compare, you, you should put here the, the first string to compare, then the second string to compare, then another option if you want. So again, is error prevention, in this case also recognition. I don't have to remember every single method for programming in any, in any programming language, but it's the system that support me in recognize just typing something and recognize that I need this and not, for instance, this. The second is even more evident. So if you want to, uh, you don't have to remember for every single font that you have in your computer, uh, which is its aspect on, on, the, on a page. But typically you have a preview of, of how the font looks like. So if you want to have uh, to write something in a font that it's like the one of type of writer, uh, you, you don't have to remember that font name is X. You open the menu and you see the preview of all the fonts and you need to scroll and select the, the font that allow you to have the effects that you want immediately recognizing the, the charter, the, the, the form, not, not remembering the name. These are other two examples, one, let's say positive in the recognition and the other, let's say not positive in the recognition. So this is supporting, this is Visual Studio Code, is supporting recognition and recall uh, for this search part here. And this is instead VI, and which is not 
supporting recognition that is supporting recall. And so these are the same operation. This is the same operation in Visual Studio Code and VI. So in Visual Studio Code, you start with search and you can, if you want to replace, uh, let's say, and with or in a text in Visual Studio Code, you can start with search, like searching, and the search can be expanded with several options, including the replace all. So you have a button here with a tooltip, with an icon that you can learn to recognize if you want, uh, but you have a tooltip for helping and how to replace one thing in the other. So if you press this, you replace all the and in or with two options. So this case is sensitive, and this means that uh, you want to, rep to replace only the entire word. So if you have and, Okay, alone, it's fine. If you have and as part of a longer word, you don't want to replace that three letter. You want just to replace and when it's when it is alone. And so this is basically recognition. You have to open these and you recognize these op these uh, these icons. If you don't, you can put the mouse on and see the tooltip. So this is a recognition for doing this this operation. This is the same operation in VI replace all the and with or uh, as a single word. And this is obviously not recognition. There is nothing to recognize the, here. We, I need to, to remember exactly what to write. And if I forgot, I don't know, this for instance, I will maybe generate some errors. I will have uh, an incorrect results. And maybe I need to go back or quit and don't save because I messed up with all the text here. So this is obviously, there are two different paradigms. This is obviously uh, text-based, it is visual. And I'm not saying that this is bad and nobody should use this, but I'm saying just that this is a very good example of recognition in a powerful tool that is a search tool. And this is a very good example of um, recall and that the user interface is doing nothing to uh, the textual user interface is doing nothing to help the user to remember to to recognize an operation, but it it all about memory and what the people are remembering in that specific moment or opening a website and looking for the solution of this this issue. So suggestion about this: uh, avoid codes when possible. Use explicit name. So. Avoid using L like we did on, the, on our website, for instance. Avoid using L for in indicating a lecture, EL for indicating an exercise in the lab, and um, EA to, in to indicate an exercise in, in the classroom. Um, and when you really need to do this, at least specify uh, what the uh, acronym means before using the acronyms in a clear way, in a clear position. Also avoid extra hurdles or check if you're applying the, the rules for extra hurdles. So avoid asking, for instance, unnecessary or premature information. Don't ask information that you will need in five pages later, just ask them five pages later. If you need, for instance, in a mobile application, this is probably something that uh, most of, of us experience, if you need a permission to use the camera once installed, uh, once you installed a mobile application, don't ask for every permission when you start the application for the first time, because the user will receive 20 different per requests of permission. But if you need the permission to use the camera when you're, to use the camera and the application is a, maybe a general purpose application that do, does is a not taking application that does a lot of things in addition to use the camera. Just ask for that permission when the user is starting the camera for the first time. Not at the beginning, once you install the application, please accept all these permission that you may or may not use. But when uh, it's useful, ask for the permission. So avoid asking for unnecessary and premature information before time. Obviously, in the case of, of a mobile application, you should ask some information at the beginning because maybe there are the permission that are necessary to actually working, having the application work. But uh, for some of these could be postponed to a, 
separate moment in the future when the user is going to use that specific feature. And also provide previews when possible, code completion, page preview like in the printing, or the summary. Okay, this is the action that you have done, and this is the summary of the order. The itinerary, you want to start from here and go to there, and this is the full itinerary to do this. So feedback also for every step and clarity. Seventh, flexibility uh, and efficient. Accelerator that are typically unseen by novice user might often speed up the interaction for expert. So for instance, the shortcut. Shortcuts are a great example of flexibility. Not everybody's using the shortcuts, but if you want to, for instance, save a file, you can either go into the file menu of your text editor and press save, or you can press Ctrl S on Windows or Command S on, on Mac, for instance, and save the page. So this is not something that is for everybody, but it's something that allow you to be more flexible for maybe power user or for repeated operation like saving, for instance. So allow also present also these and obviously present these in a clear way that is understandable and it's easy to find. And allow also to tailor this shortcut. So maybe there is another function and I want to, to add a shortcut for this function. I want to change the shortcut because I have another application that is doing a similar function and I'm, I'm, I already learned the shortcut and I'm going to reuse the same shortcut also. In, I would like to reuse the same shortcut also in other application to avoid having shortcuts for the same feature for the same action that are different among different applications. So allow this flexibility also for, for the user. And a suggestion, flexibility means that you have a default and then you have options. So you can also, flexibility means that uh, if you think a train ticket machine, maybe uh, if you say, I would like to go to this city, the, the ticket machine presents you some popular choices or the next train that go in that city. But if you, if you don't have this the, the option here, you can also press no, it's not here in the list and enter a different day, enter a different date, uh, enter a different time for, for the train or select only uh, regional train or only high speed train. And so perform other um, choices uh, in addition to the default choices, the popular, the next train that will start from here that are the default option. Uh, you can also uh, exploit background information for providing more contextual and proactive information when needed. So for instance, in a calendar interface, if you are planning an outside event, it could be very useful to have the weather forecast for that day. Or if you're planning a online meeting like this, it could be, be useful to have inside the calendar the option to set up the Zoom link for, for the meeting to create this link in the calendar. It's not the main task of the calendar to do this, but it's useful for, uh, for the people that are using the main function of the calendar that is scheduling things to have additional information when needed, also in a proactive way. So not just reacting to what the user is doing, but also suggesting, okay, you, you have done this, and but you can also consider this now. Uh, also sort of recommendation trying, to provide relevant information uh, for, for the relevant piece of interface when possible. Hate, and we are going to, to towards the end, uh, aesthetic and design minimalism. Mm -hmm. So in general, the website, the application, the dialogue should not contain irrelevant or not really useful information. Mm -hmm. Every bit of information is related to the relevant information. And if you have too much information on the page, the visibility of the important information is diminished, is less, is more invisible. And these are, for instance, two example. Uh, so here you have a list and it's a straightforward list. It's not a really long list and you can select here and open here. And here, for instance, you have a timesheet um, in which you, for instance, in, in the timesheet, you have a series of action and some uh, hours to put here. And so you see here that, for instance, you don't have it. This is already 
let's say, complex or uh, overcrowded of information because you have the day, you have the action, you have a spot to, to say the, the hour, you need to have the total uh, for each activity and for each day uh, because we have some rules to respect typically in timesheets. But you see, you, you don't have uh, extra information like hours. They are not reporting hours, the word hours after every field, for instance, because it's obvious that in the timesheet these are these are hours. They could have actually put hours here, maybe also or in the total here, just to remind that these are not minutes but hours. Uh, but it, it's it's a knowledge that everybody who, who fill a timesheet know that you have to insert hours in that spot. So avoid to, to say hours spent per day in every single cell. It's, it's a good example in that sense. And when you have to have key information, uh, the key information must be above the fold. This is in the first part of a user interface. So when you ideally, when you open a website, for instance, the above the fold um, part of the user interface is the, the, the things that fit in your screen. So if you have low resolution device, this part that fit in your screen will be smaller. So if it's in the beginning of the page on the top, it's better because obviously it's always visible and reachable. And then keep high signal to noise ratio, use color. You have seen visual design, use color with uh, wisely, not too much, not too few, use fonts, but use this element to uh, identify that something is different in the page, something is convey information also with this, uh, this element, colors, font, the ground, animation, borders, and so on. Uh, accept also redundant way of entering information and try not to add too many features if they are not really uh, focused on the core functionality. Maybe some of them are useful for, let's say, uh, the, the flexibility, others are really just more features that are not really useful or not really uh, answering the, code fun the core functionality. Maybe it should be optional, maybe it should be enabled in a separate way, but just not available from day one. Then the last two were about errors and help. Uh, the nine say help user recognize, diagnose and recover from errors so that error messages should be expressed in plain languages. So no 503 internal server error, but plain languages and indicate the problem and suggest a solution as we said before. So these are two very two examples. Uh, this is a, a not found page. And you see there is a picture, there is uh, some option. There's an explanation of what is happening here. The page isn't here anymore. So you are using a link that is bringing nowhere. And what you can do, you can report it using this form and there is a link, or you can uh, recognize that this page is not found and you can see all the other uh, article and all the other, uh, all the other blog posts so that uh, you can uh, read other things that could be interesting to you. And this is another example of a, a good error message. Now, it, it asks you to, to create a new account with a username, a password, and retype a password, and then uh, write an email address. Um, and it gives you an error that is specific for each field. So when you write Bert here, it says Bert is already taken. Choose a different username. There is the error, and there is the action that you can do as a user. Uh, I insert a tree, uh, a password of three letter. Password will be at least six charter. It can only contain letters and numbers. So it give specific information of why it's an error. And in addition, it say that the error is not generic on the form, but is specific to this field. Also this, the email does not appear to be valid. Obviously, this is not an email, this is just text. So very specific feedback and error related to very specific fields. These are two good examples of how to convey errors, how to help people, users to overcome errors. So make color easy to identify, again, errors. Make problem clear, which is the cause, which is the location of, of, of the error and how to solve the error. You can give a suggestion, use a password longer than this. 
the mail should be done, should be written with uh, name at domain, for instance. Uh, show a path forward. Okay, this page is not found. Click here to go to the home page. Uh, we have an error. Click here to report the error and propose an alternative possible. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if the action that the user is not cannot do, propose an alternative to to support this action is possible. But provide a solution in some sense. So make the problem clear. What happens? Why there is a problem? which is the location of the problem, if, if apply, and provide a solution for this problem. And conversely, if you see, and you try to apply this rule, if you see an interface that doesn't make the problem clear, doesn't provide a suggestion, and uh, doesn't make the error easy, easy to identify, because maybe they don't use color, they don't use font, but just text, small text around elements, or in the top of the form, let's say there is an error something like that, then you know that these rules is uh, violated and you can uh, write as an expert the violation. Finally, help and documentation that is partially related to the previous one, uh, but not only for errors in general. So even though it's, it's better if a system, a user, a user interface can be used without documentation at all, sometimes for some features, could be necessary to provide some help or some documentation or some clarification. And such information when it's present should be easy to search, focus on the user task, not again on the system task and least concrete step to be carried out and not too large. So you, you don't want to provide a 100 pages documentation for a feature on your application, but just the, the information that is needed to uh, move on and according in the few, in the user language uh, with easy to found um, uh, help. And these are two, two examples. So if you uh, install for the first time or you are a novice user of this picnic college, uh, you can press on this question mark and see uh, eight pages, not so long, eight step process that provide you an interview uh, overview of the, of the software. So in which the first one say, what, um, what is the, the goal of the application making college of the photos, then you can click next and see maybe another feature. So it, it train, it accompany the user in discovering uh, what the application is doing and which are the possibility, which are the function, what can be done, what cannot be done and so on. And here also there is a help page uh, of this Barry that report some text and there's also a video to explain some uh, additional feature of the of the application in this case of the website to so provide help when needed here is uh, general on the on the application here is in general presenting the website but it could be also a tool tip somewhere so if you have maybe some option you ask the user to to choose from option a b and c and which one is right for me? Is option A, option B, option C? So give some help if needed, in this case, contextually, uh, to, to, to take the right decision for them. And so you can say, okay, use option A when you are in this condition, use option B in this other case, and option C works best for this other case. As before, suggestion and things to keep an eye on it, provide example in documentation, in complex choices. So just don't just say, mm, select these, but, or let's say, uh, let's imagine an uh, email, just don't say you have to insert an email, but, or you have, you have to use a password that is one charter, one charter, one letter, uh, one capital letter, uh, one special character. What is a special character for you? If I insert a Russian character, for me it's a special character. But maybe for you it's not a special character. Maybe for you a special character is an exclamation mark. So if you say special character and provide an example, open parenthesis, uh, exclamation mark, question mark, uh, hash, and so on, then you have provided example in 
some choices that the user is going to do or in some input field that the user is going to, to, to fill out. Uh, then help the user understanding the gravity of the error of the warning. So for instance, uh, printing outside margin. So if you have a preview of printer and saying, okay, you're printing outside margin, what does it mean printing outside margin? So maybe if you depict this, if you show the page with the text outside the margin, the user could say, oh, yes, I set up the margin in a wrong way. I can uh, fix it. Or maybe the user is saying, I don't care because I was printing an image in that page and I would like the image to be bigger. And the image is in the margin. It's the text that is inside the margin. And it's fine for me for that scope that I was going to do while printing. So help the user understand the error of gravity in this case, providing a picture of what's happening for printing outside the margin. Uh, similar way, provide tips for showing new actional steps like here. This could be a tip and also popovers to point to change in UI. So if you have a user interface and, that, and you are going to maybe recreate after three years that everybody's using that user interface, you can use suggestion, contextual help to point out changes that you made in, you, in the UI so that people are, uh, are not so disoriented in the interface for, for the first time or the first, or the first let's say five usages of the interface. And if you need to adopt term and condition, avoid two opaque term and conditions. So not one 11 pages of term and condition uh, written in lower term, but shorter and summarized. This is not only um, a suggestion here, this is actually normative because the GPDR, uh, the, the European law uh, about privacy and uh, uh, about privacy mainly is uh, as a specific note that say that terms and conditions should be under, should be short and understandable to everybody before accepting. So also for, to, by a child. So you cannot use too complex word or um, lawyer term to specify things. But term and conditions should be simple, summarized and understandable by everybody. So this is not only a suggestion, it's, it's also normative in the European Union to do this. As always, some references. So here uh, we, we can conclude the, the lecture here, the lecture year. As I told you, next time, not tomorrow, we will have the lab. And next time, you will do an exercise applying the heuristic evaluation. Uh, so if you can rewatch or watch, not the entire lecture because it's three hours, probably it's too much, but to watch this that is shorter or some of these, I will find it at a certain point. Rewatch these videos or watch for the first time these videos so that uh, you can have a refreshing uh, ideas of which are these 10 uh, heuristics, if you can. So if you don't have any, any question, we can stop the, the lecture here and go having lunch. Any question? Okay. I can stop the recording in the meantime. If you have any questions, you can write in the chat.